Okay, so we will start around 5.05. I will do the introduction, which I have uh, I have it here in my computer. Uh, just a simple introduction, and then I will uh, hold you upon each one of you. Edward, you will you will go first on, on the on the talk, and then followed by Mustafa, and then uh, Aaron. I hope you don't mind if I have called you on, uh, put on that uh, order. And then uh, after the talk, after your presentation between 15 to 20 minutes, I uh, will pose two questions in general uh, for three of you. And each one of you can take five minutes just to, you know, to share your views and uh, actually experience uh, throughout this pandemic uh, on your institute, with your institution and, uh, you know, working life and everything. And after that, uh, we will go into the uh, Q&A questions uh, from the audience for another half an hour, and then by then we'll be already 6.45, 6.50. So we can just wrap up the, the whole discussion by 6.55, more or less. I hope, it, hope that is fine. Sounds good. Yeah. So. So we already have 51 participants coming in. I have sent the invitation to some of my friends in Peru. So hopefully they can uh, wake up today in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, so they can share, they can, uh, they can listen to you uh, on your presentation, hopefully. We are 13 hours ahead. I think uh, Aaron will be less. Ernesto, do you, not, do you need us to uh, maybe uh, turn off our cameras or? Uh, no, 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 because I have, uh, I have Two different screens, so I just move okay. in the, the screens. Yeah, that's not necessary, only the just the mute.
Okay, uh, let's go to start. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone is doing fine. Let me start today. Um, welcome to Gallery Week in Kuala Lumpur 2020. Today talk is on, is the third of the series Luminari and the title is Curating and Collecting, Way of Seeing. My name is Ernesto Pogazon and I will be your host and moderator. So before I proceed, I would like to uh, just make some announcement. Kindly turn off your device, your microphone device during the speaker presentation. And as you know, if you like to own your video, please uh, join us. Feel free to write the questions on the QA box. Uh, so we will uh, share that with the speakers. And today, allow me to introduce uh, the speakers. Edward Giff is the chairman and head, depart head of department Middle East in India, London, Sotheby, currently in UK. Shazbi uh, Hussein Mustafa is a senior curator, National Gallery, Singapore, in Singapore Art Museum, currently in Singapore. And Aaron Sito is director of the Museum Machan, Jakarta, Indonesia, currently in Sydney. Thank you for being with us today. So let me talk about the presentation dynamic. As a follow, each panelist will have 50 to 20 minute presentation. And then um, after that, I will post two questions on your views on what happened with the pandemic and how you have tackled these issues. And so after that, we will move into a overall um, Q&A question from the audience. So please let me invite uh, Mr. Edward Gift to speak to us on Sotheby 2020 Transformative Innovation and Results. Edward, please. Thank you very much, Ernesto. Can everybody hear me? Good. Um, thank you very much, Ernesto, and thank you very much for this kind invitation to join the panel of luminaries. I shall attempt to be as luminous as possible and to shed light on what's been happening at Sotheby's over the last eight to 10 months. COVID and the lockdown that ensued was really an asteroid strike for ourselves, our families, our businesses, our livelihoods. It has affected us all personally and professionally in ways that we could never have imagined possible. When the asteroid strikes, you are either evolve or you die. Necessity being the mother of invention, we at Sotheby's look to ways to innovate, to adapt to the new environment and to mitigate the impact. The challenge in one way was huge, but in another way it was simple. How could we, a traditional live event auction business, engage our clients electronically? and transition them over to our online platforms. How to make the pivot from physical to digital, from live auctions to online only sales. Of course, companies that had previously invested in technology were at a distinct advantage. During COVID, leveraging digital innovation has allowed industry leaders to dis distinguish themselves meaningfully from their competitors. Of course, not all business models lend themselves to digital innovation. And to the outside world, auction houses may seem traditional establishments. They might appear to be bastions of wealth accessible only to a privileged few. The reality is in fact very different. First, let, let me say that over 90% of what we sell at Sotheby's is under $10,000. And the majority of that is under $5,000. It's only the record masterpieces sales that you hear about. Secondly, the company itself is driven by a young dynamic workforce, the majority of whom are under 40. Sotheby's is a hive of youthful innovation and the successes of 2020 have only been made possible by the creativity and resourcefulness of this young team. So faced with unprecedented challenges, what we came up with was a new pioneering live stream global marquee auction. Can I have the next two slides, please? This auction was a hybrid live slash virtual event taking place across three continents simultaneously in real time. 
This new type of auction was conducted by an auctioneer from a studio in London, speaking to phone banks of socially distanced people in other studios in New York, London, and Hong Kong, who in turn were talking to buyers on the phone and placing bids on their behalf. If you're wondering what this looks like, I have a video to play for you. And Stephanie, could you run the first video, please? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to Sotheby's. Tonight, a multi-camera global live stream will enable me to see and field bids from around the world in real time. I'll be your auctioneer for what promises to be an historic evening. The extraordinary Francis Bacon from 1981 at 50 million dollars, 55, 70 million dollars. Thank you. There's a new bidder at Sotheby's.com, 71 million 100,000. It's back online again, Greg, and I need 72 from you. 72 million dollars, 74 million at 74 million dollars, and I'm selling it here against you online. Fair warning at 74 million dollars. Thank you very much indeed. The extraordinary Jean-Michel Basquiat, Untitled Head from 1982. Give me the bid online, please. Seven million dollars, seven million five hundred thousand, eight million dollars now. Twelve million four is bid. Thank you, Barman. Twelve million five hundred thousand, twelve million six hundred thousand. And I'm selling it to you at home at thirteen million one hundred thousand. It's a new world record price. The head is yours. The Matthew Wong, the realm of appearances, at 180,000, 200,000 I have already, 400,000, still with a commission bidder at 850,000 against all of you here. At 1,100,000, I see you, Yuki, 1,150,000. At 1,500,000 is bid with Brooke Lampley at 1,500,000, records breaking at Sotheby's, sold. Helen Frankenthaler from 1975, the Royal Furworks, 1,600,000, 1,700,000, 2,200,000 is with Sarah and against you, Lisa, 3,200,000. 4 million 800,000, 5 million dollars here. All in New York, the battle of the lady bidders. Anybody else want to come in? 6 million dollars, 6 million 600,000. At 6 million seven, fair warning, last chance. Thank you, Brooke. The masterpiece by Wilfredo Lam, the Omi Obini, at 6 million 200,000, 6 million 500,000, 7 million 200,000. Thank you, Thomas. 8 million dollars, 8 million 100,000. And selling at 8 million 200,000 dollars. The wonderful Pablo Picasso, at 8,800,000, 9,500,000 is your bid, 9,600,000. This year, Sotheby's has redefined the auction house as we know it. We've done this through embracing innovative new auction formats, including this multi-camera global live stream marquee sale. And this has offered new ways to engage with art and objects. Sotheby's innovations have generated significant momentum and excitement in the market. And most importantly, they've delivered exceptional results for our consigners. On the screen, you can see some of those results. Um, the Francis Bacon that was referred to in the video, selling for $84.6 million in New York in June. The Juan Miro made $30.5 million in London in July. And the Gerhard Richter abstract painting was sold in Hong Kong in October, 2020. That's the highest price for any Western artwork sold in Asia at $27.7 million. Uh, there are also works by other notable modern masters, Giacometti, Lichtenstein, Basquiat, and Banksy, a great favorite in London, um, as well as the old master painter Rembrandt, whose self-portrait made $18.7 million in July in London. We have held 12 of these live stream auctions in New York, London, Paris, and Hong Kong. They've brought aggregated sales of $1.1 billion. 
92% uh, of the, the lots have been sold, which is a very high sell through rate. And the record price for the year is the Francis Bacon triptych at just under $85 million. Next slide, please. The sales have received ecstatic reception in the media. And one commentator wrote, it was surprising to me that one could draw such a large contrast in real time experience between the Sotheby's and Christie's auctions. Technologically, think Boris Johnson when you say Christie's. Sotheby's was closer to Elon Musk. I think that's a disgraceful slur on Boris Johnson. And personally, if you ask me who, who I'd rather have dinner with, I would say Boris Johnson over Elon Musk. But technologically, clearly Musk has the edge over Johnson. These virtual events link buyers across the globe. And one commentator said, they play out like a high stakes night at the casino, a fascinating, well done virtual event. I saw the future of the auction business and it worked. We have also to give credit to Sotheby's for the production values of their major sales, which I think raised the game for the entire industry. They brought in a production company and really did make it a visually pleasing experience, which quite honestly, I think will be here to stay. Next slide, please. As well as these large scale marquee events, we've also been very busy with online only auctions. Um, these have continued to soar to new unmatched heights. Accessible and convenient, our online only auctions have generated interest from an unprecedented audience of new and established buyers. <clears throat> One interesting statistic is that 30% of our bidders in these auctions are under the age of 40. So this is really rejuvenating the market and, and providing a platform for the next generation of collectors. Next slide, please. The other interesting statistic is that we've seen strong bidding, bidding in every category. I and mean, you might ask me, um, are these digital platforms only suited to contemporary and more cutting edge art? And the answer is no. We can see traditional categories also performing outstandingly. For instance, on the left there, there are two slides of Orientalist paintings um, by the Russian artist Ivazovsky and the German Orientalist painter Bauenfeind. And both of these works made in excess of $2 million in an online only sale with no exhibition and no live auction and no live auctioneer. And um, other categories in the luxury division, watches has had a stellar year. You see the Rolex uh, yellow gold chronograph Daytona, which sold at Sotheby's in London in July and made $1.5 million, which was a record price for a, a Rolex watch. And at the far right, um, again, another traditional category, um, Chinese antiquities, a sculpture of Guan Yin sold in New York in June for $1.3 million in an online only sale with no auctioneer. Next slide, please. Commentators in the industry have been keeping praise on these online only auctions. Um, Abby Schultz, um, who's a well-known industry commentator said Sotheby's was the big winner among the auction houses for online sales in the first months of eight months of the year and has captured nearly 63% of the fine art market between the three top auction houses. Next slide, please. In addition, um, we have been conducting private sales. This is the hidden part of the iceberg, which is becoming more visible now. Um, Sotheby's is the largest private dealer in the secondary market. Uh, you may know Sotheby's for its glamorous public auctions, but away from the theater of the auction floor, the firm is also doing brisk business in private sales. Um, $1.4 billion of private sale transactions this year, over a thousand transactions in total processed, um, the total 1.4 billion is a 90% rise on the total last year, and the volume is 30% 30, is 30 up. And on the right, you can see the interior of our East Hampton showroom, where we showcase works for private sale over the summer. Uh, that's a, a retail pop-up sort of buy now space, uh, which is now relocated to Palm Springs. 
and is doing a very brisk trade there. Next slide, please. Twenty twenty has been a story of resilience and innovation, with pioneering new auction formats. Firstly, the live stream marquee auction. Secondly, the purely digital online only format without an auctioneer. And thirdly, and we can now go forward three slides, please. The groundbreaking cross category auction, Rembrandt to Richter, masterpieces from 500 years of art history in one live marquee event held in London in July, 2020. Stephanie, could you play the video please? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to Sotheby's. Rembrandt to Richter is a pioneering cross-category evening sale spanning over 500 years of art history. And I'm going to start the bidding here. 150,000, 150, 160. I want to start the bidding here. Some interest, one million pounds. This is a once in a generation opportunity. The extraordinary Rembrandt self-portrait at 10 million five, 11 million pounds. At 12 million, 600,000 pounds. The masterpiece by Juan Miro at 18 million pounds. For 20 million, 650,000 pounds. The wonderful Giacometti, 4 million, 500,000. Fair warning, 9 million, 200,000 pounds. This fabulous Fernand Leger, 9.7, at 10 million five. Thank you, Sam. This large scale Gerhard Richter, the Vulcan Fenster, at £8 million pounds, for £9 million. Pounds. At £4,500,000, give me five, please. £5,200,000, and it's against you. And the next bid is £6,100,000. Give me 6-1. Okay. So, £2,300,000, £4,100,000, and it's against you. £2,300,000, and you're going to bid on this one. Yeah, you're going to bid on this one. Yeah, you're going to bid on this one. I will from you. Thank you, Liz. 50,000, an impressionist expert buying your cello at 1,400,000. It's a modern master here with Banksy. Alex Bell, bid for the old masters and selling for 1,850,000. Give me a million, please. And selling. Just to sum up, 2020 has been a period of opportunity, not retrenchment, in which Sotheby's has shifted gears to adapt to the new environment, moving from an event-driven, object-first marketplace to a full-service, digital-first industry. This allows for a less intimidating, more inclusive experience and a potentially exponential scaling up of the business opening it up to many new participants. The challenge for auction houses in the future is how to maximize the advantages of digital innovation without compromising the traditional strengths of a centuries old brand. As digital fatigue sets in, as it surely will, and we start to tire of virtual formats and repetitive content, to what extent do we go back to live experience and direct physical encounter? Our industry is experiential and relationship led. How do we balance the needs of seasoned buyers and digital newbies? Will things return to the way they were? Or in the words of the auctioneer, are these changes here to stay? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Edward. Really interesting the way how Sotheby has uh, tackled this, this issue, the pandemic, and uh, it's really nice to, to see the, the new vision that uh, Sotheby has. Now, let me invite uh, Mustafa from National Museum Singapore and Singapore Art Museum to uh, share with us uh, his talk. Mustafa, please.
Thank you, uh, Ernesto. Um, I just want to uh, begin by thanking the organizers, uh, especially the uh, Shalini and uh, GWKL, I think, and everybody who's been working on it. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, looking forward to the conversations uh, afterwards as well. Um, I thought I would title uh, my uh, presentation today after a poetic fragment uh, by the Malaysian artist uh, Latif Mohidin from the 1970s, and it's titled Any Wonder uh, Once Again. And uh, essentially, uh, it's a fragment uh, that is written at a time of immense uh, social and political upheaval. And he's sort of asking uh, a very simple uh, question. How do we balance uh, human memory uh, with objectification? And uh, are there newer ways of thinking about the world uh, when uh, the world itself uh, is changing uh, quite rapidly and in, in ways that we fully do not understand? So what I'll do today is kind of take you through uh, what the National Gallery does uh, very quickly. And uh, I'll also talk a little bit about uh, Latif Mohidin and a project that I've been developing with him uh, over the past five to six years or so. So just to get uh, started, um, the National Gallery of Singapore is uh, actually a very young organization. It opened in November 2015, and we just celebrated our fifth anniversary, in fact, uh, yesterday. So um, just to give a sense of uh, what we do, uh, the curatorial vision is uh, quite, um, in a sense, uh, very much lodged within stories of Southeast Asian art. And our hope is to really be lodged within uh, questions of the art historical especially in Singapore, of course, being the National Gallery of Singapore, but also within the region uh, that's Southeast Asia. And the hope, of course, uh, is to try and write and rewrite uh, some of the art histories that have been written and received uh, from all sorts of different sources. And so a lot of the work that we do is uh, aggregational, so often bringing different individuals together into a conversation. And of course, a lot of our work is not seen in isolation, uh, but also very much in dialogue uh, with our regional, but also our global uh, partners. And this is something I'll touch upon in a little bit as well. Um, this is the building. Uh, for those of uh, you who are not familiar with it, we essentially occupy two historic buildings in the downtown um, of Singapore. Uh, we have the former Supreme Court, which is on the left, which occupies the Southeast Asia galleries, which I'll come to in a little bit. And then we have the Singapore galleries, which is the, these are the two long-term displays uh, that we maintain. Uh, and then uh, the rest of the spaces essentially are used for changing exhibitions. Uh, the first uh, uh, project that I want to talk about is of course the Singapore galleries. And in a sense, this is very important because uh, Singapore, uh, as we all know, uh, has always been an entrepot, right? Right from the 16th century onwards. And essentially it's been a meeting ground for all sorts of different perspectives, and this relates uh, to questions around the aesthetic. And uh, the Singapore galleries uh, would house, just like the Southeast Asia galleries, which I will talk about in a little bit, house about 350 works uh, at any given time, ranging from the 19th century to the present day. And what we do each year since our opening uh, is we rotate about 150 works, which means that about a third of the displays are completely overhauled. And essentially the overhaul is part of the much larger kind of research and collection building initiatives uh, that the curators and the team of curators, so myself and my colleagues are working on uh, at all times. And the hope of course, you know, is to build connections and perspectives because we understand that artists exist within networks. And of course, this network building takes time, but it's also something that the curatorial uh, intersects with and attempts to build through the process of exhibition making. The other uh, long-term display that we maintain and which I uh, also oversee, uh, it connects to Southeast Asian art. And essentially this is very similar to the S uh, Singapore galleries, but of course I think occupies a much larger footprint uh, within the museum. And we, we essentially survey artistic perspectives from the region of Southeast Asia from about the mid 19th century to the present day. Again, we have about 400 works on display at any given time and each year we rotate about 150 works. So these long-term displays are essentially seen as works in progress. And of course, uh, when uh, COVID uh, hit and the museum closed down, essentially the perspective between the physical encounter of the artwork, say for example, these works that you see here on the screen, and the human body was disrupted. And I'll come to how we kind of attempted 
uh, to engage with this disruption uh, in, in, from a kind of a museological or even a curatorial point of view. But one of the other things that we also do is constantly engage with our changing exhibitions. And changing exhibitions are really crucial because they become kind of uh, really rapid attempts at expanding research on artists, uh, movements, uh, even particular historical or social moments, right, uh, within Southeast Asia's past. And so, for instance, if you look at these two works here by the Indonesian artist uh, Radhan Saleh, Javanese actually, um, pre-Indonesia in that sense, um, we featured uh, these two works in a very important changing exhibition uh, that was held in 2017. But then thereafter, we retained these works in the Southeast Asia galleries as a way to enhance uh, the kind of access uh, that works can create. And this um, is something that became very crucial because obviously at a time when museums are facing huge uh, financial and logistical disruptions, whether borrowing artworks for three to four months is something that's feasible or not needs to be rethought. Can museums be looking to expand uh, their, their footprint by essentially loaning for the long term and then developing perspectives from that point of view? So this is something that we could potentially think about. But at the same time, we're also constantly moving and doing research on lesser known aspects of Southeast Asia. For example, Brunei. And um, I run a project which is called the Brunei Art History Project, which essentially uh, means traveling to Brunei and, and, and interviewing an entire generation of Bruneian artists that emerged in the 1960s. And this is uh, the, the previous work you saw is a study uh, of a much larger mural that you see in Brunei. But at the same time, we're expanding slowly and really looking beyond kind of the, the, the easel painting and uh, sculpture making within the kind of modern episteme and uh, very carefully looking at architecture and design. So just recently last year, um, I co-curated an exhibition with colleagues at the gallery titled Suddenly Turning Visible, Art and Architecture in Southeast Asia, where we surveyed how uh, the visual arts and architectural practice came together between 1969 to 1989 in three cities, Manila, Bangkok, and Singapore. So in a sense, we're still assessing the story of visual art, but constantly from varied uh, perspectives. And in this case, it, it was architecture and design. And of course, uh, we have a very, very rigorous publications process, and this is constantly moving. So in the last five to six years, we kind of publish a whole series of volumes which build uh, the story of Southeast Asian art. You may also uh, recognize Patrick Flores, who was uh, one of the co-editors of this volume. Uh, he, I think he spoke at, uh, at, at, at one of the luminary sessions yesterday or day before. But we even push this further. So just uh, recently we've established over the last three years, we've established a minor in art history program, Singapore's first after a long time, since the 1970s, where uh, the curators in the National Gallery essentially hold teaching positions at the National University of Singapore. And this is quite important, not just as a way to develop newer uh, publics, but to also then in a sense, uh, engage with a future generation of curators who are yet uh, to be, or art historians for that matter. But also constantly building into lesser known aspects of Southeast Asian art. So for example, take a figure like Amida Sinasa, around whom a lot of new research is emerging, of course, from within the National Gallery, but also beyond in Indonesia and in Europe. So trying to work in newer frontiers, you know, thinking about uh, how women artists, for example, uh, could be represented in the collection. I mean, if one is to survey any museological collection today, guess which gender is represented overwhelmingly. So I think these are sort of corrections uh, that need to happen. But at the same time, we think about how artists have also always been at the center of social and political uh, kind of upheavals. And they have always found ways to think about how we can come out of these kind of really complex situations. And Samsa Siahan, for example, is one such critical figure who emerges in Indonesia uh, in the 1970s and 80s, who challenges uh, what it means to build conventions in art and within society. So this painting, for example, which is in the National Gallery's collection, really personifies the challenges that Southeast Asia faces, right? Uh, between the former kind of colonial powers and essentially the kind of impact of uh, neoliberal or neoliberal economic policies amongst the vast majority of the population. But then of course we have our changing exhibitions which I've mentioned and these are often uh, developed in collaboration uh, with uh, critical institutions around the world, for example, Reframing Modernism was our first. 
And now this brings me to my essential case study today, uh, which is Latif Mohidin's Pago Pago project. And I like you to keep this image in mind because this image, although it is a rather small uh, ink on paper drawing, essentially is a work uh, that Latif Mohidin makes uh, in an ethnographic museum in Dahlem, which is a kind of a suburb of the city of Berlin uh, in West Germany in 1961, where he's studying art. And it's a kind of a image that he constructs after having encountered Thai and Khmer archaeological relics in an ethnological museum. And Latif Moedin, of course, is one of Malaysia's uh, most uh, revered modernist painters. And so I'm not going to try and get into too much of his biographical details, but I just want to keep in mind that he is in Berlin at a time when Berlin itself is very soon uh, to be divided along ideological lines. And again, to think about the potential of art at a moment in time when there is immense social, political, uh, and even cultural shifts is a, is, a, is a critical question. In fact, we should be talking more about art uh, than less of it uh, at this time. Of course, the result is the famous uh, Pago Pago series uh, around which uh, my case study is based today. And essentially, uh, a lot of these perspectives came to bear in uh, an exhibition uh, that uh, we co-curated uh, with uh, our colleagues at the Centre Pompidou in Paris in 2018, with Catherine David uh, in particular, tracking essentially what exactly was the image uh, that Latif Mohidin was attempting to conceive in the 1960s and how essentially this image could converse with uh, perspectives or even um, relationally uh, to what was happening in Europe uh, at the time. And of course, uh, the, the response uh, was quite overwhelming and quite humbling. And, um, you know, I think just, just flashing more images here to give us a sense that reality at the end of the day is complex. And I think perhaps by listening to artists who have lived through complex moments in uh, human history, I think perhaps we can find ways, we can find strategies uh, to think about uh, what it means to come out of this uh, pandemic. And I'll come to some kind of strategies, I suppose, that we've designed since then. But just to give you a sense uh, of the complex position that a figures like Latif Mohedin occupy. Now, this is an image with Latif Mohedin on the, on the left and the, 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 the incredibly important Thai painter, Tawan Buchani. So Latif Mohedin has returned back from Berlin and decides to keep going further north. And so he ends up in Thailand, he ends up in Cambodia, Lao, and this is, of course, uh, when the Second Indochina War is going on, popularly known uh, as the Vietnam War is going on. So what does it mean for an artist to navigate through these difficult times? A lot like how, in a sense, I suppose uh, we are facing today, but also working through a very, very fun, uh, simple uh, uh, infrastructure, you know, like for example, you wanna show paintings, but you don't really have walls uh, to show them on. So in a sense, I think thinking about the conventions uh, of artistic practice. This is a fantastic image, actually, because you see Latif Moedin in the center, standing at the Eco de Beaux-Arts in Laos, in, 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 in Vientiane. And often this is the only surviving image, as far as we know about this art school in Vientiane. So I think it's all, and then here he is seated next to uh, the Indonesian uh, writer, uh, uh, poet uh, Taufik Ismail. The exhibition subsequently traveled uh, to Kuala Lumpur, uh, which is, of course, uh, Lato Moedin's home. Uh, of course, he lives in Penang, but Malaysia uh, really is his home. And uh, as the exhibition moved, we began to develop a whole series of conversations with individuals uh, that he was connected to in the 1960s. For example, here you have uh, the, 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 the writer Terence Ward, uh, Latif Moedin in the center, and then you have the writer from Jakarta, Gunawan Mohamed, really engaging with what it meant to write in the 1960s and move uh, in the 1960s. Similarly, we continue uh, these conversations in Kuala Lumpur as well. A lot of these proceedings are now available online uh, as well, if you want to revisit uh, a lot of these uh, kind of very critical uh, approaches uh, that one could take in the study of Southeast Asian art. But then we continue to find things uh, as well. Here you have an image of uh, Latif Mohidin with uh, the Indonesian painter Edi Pirus, and they're seated in uh, Edi Pirus's uh, apartment in um, New York City in 1969. And a lot of these things are facilitated, of course, uh, through digital technologies, especially WhatsApp. So I think, um, you know, research 
my point is that research continues. Research continues in a differentiated form. Uh, it's not the same as having going to Bandung and talking to uh, somebody like Park Perus. But the point here is that the, the research somehow manifests and continues to grow thanks to uh, the digital. Which brings me to the most recent manifestation of the exhibition. And this is uh, the exhibition that launched in Singapore at the National Gallery, just as the COVID-19 <laughs> lockdowns came in. So essentially we opened a day before uh, the famous, uh, now famous circuit breaker measures uh, came in. And uh, even uh, the artists couldn't travel from Penang to Singapore because the borders closed down. And so in a sense, you had opened an exhibition, but then there were, nobody was permitted to see it. It was almost a kind of an archeological site uh, that had been abandoned uh, as soon as it had been uh, built. But of course, uh, the exhibition stood there uh, for the first three months uh, of the lockdown, uh, not having seen uh, that many uh, visitors. But what we decided to do was as the lockdowns persisted in the first couple of weeks, we thought that perhaps one way to think about a figure like Latif Mohidin would be to return to his written word because Latif Mohidin is not just known as a painter in Malaysia or in Southeast Asia, he's also known as it's one of its foremost poets modern poets in that sense. And we began to actually congregate individuals, translators, poets, writers, thinkers, artists uh, online. And all, a lot of them started reciting Latif Mohidin's poetry, uh, which was written at a very, very complex time. So it also kind of thinks about what, it, what solitude means, what immense change means, uh, what it means to exist in a state of flux. And uh, surprisingly, we had, huge, huge audiences uh, coming in and listening to poetry. And maybe poetry becomes a way uh, for us to imagine, right? Something else, something that is yet to be, something that is still in the midst of forming. But then at the same time, we decided to kind of really push uh, the digital and just kind of make sense of where exactly the possibilities lie because the digital is a kind of a, a horizontal and a vertical uh, space, right? And, and, and I think the digital only makes sense if one is able to successfully build context within it. And this context needs to be made, it needs to be generated. And we realize that it's not a substitute, obviously, to the physical, but it's something which enables us to expand publics in ways that we had not initially imagined. So again, you're able to speak and reach out to individuals who are not in a kind of a territorially confined space, which physical uh, symposiums were kind of, in a sense, uh, determining. So um, again, uh, you can see here, we have incredible individuals who came together and, and, and we had uh, uh, extensive uh, conversations, not just on Latif Mohidin's art, but really how do we generate kind of speculative assemblages uh, to, to enhance livability, right? At the everyday level and at everyday life. So what can the curator do? What can the artist do? What can the museum do? at a time like this. And perhaps I'm gonna uh, wrap up here uh, very quickly uh, by showing you a map. So one of the uh, stories that the Singapore exhibition actually attempted to unravel uh, was Latif Mohidin's childhood in Singapore because he lived in Singapore from 1949 to 54 and he lived in a very special neighborhood called Kampong Glam, which is essentially the kind of traditional um, uh, neighborhood where um, all, communities from the Malay world would come and live because Singapore has been cosmopolitan for a number of centuries, in fact. And uh, he grew up in this zone because his father used to run a lodging house for Hajj pilgrims who would come to Singapore and then get on the ships uh, to, uh, uh, to Arabia. And this map is quite incredible because it is drawn out of memory about how it looked like in 1949 and it's annotated with all sorts of stories. And again, physical space was not accessible. You had lockdowns. And so a lot of the programs that were planned for these things somehow just couldn't happen. So this is a workable map huh, that was produced and displayed in the exhibition, but was also printed and circulated quite widely. And so we invited uh, the artist, Barney Heikel, uh, who uh, we were planning, uh, to, uh, he, uh, we were planning for the contemporary artist Bani Heikel to work with somebody like Latif Mohidin to kind of think of ways uh, to animate uh, the map. But this was pre-COVID, 
But during COVID, both the artists effectively couldn't meet. And so Bani uh, decided to respond by essentially visiting the area and collecting sounds whenever some movement was feasible and possible uh, throughout the city, just to listen uh, to what does it mean uh, to be in this state today. And one of the things uh, we realized is that with COVID-19, uh, matter, uh, as we understand it, is being reorganized in really radical ways. And this is something that I think uh, artists have been doing for centuries, reorganizing matter in fantastic ways. And uh, what Bani uh, did was he began to use Latif Muhyiddin's map to move through the space, but he started moving through sound and moving through, uh, in a sense, a kind of a computer generated coding system. So I'll maybe end uh, with um, uh, this video that we'll watch. It's about a minute long, uh, but really kind of asking like, what is the sensorial capacity of matter today? What is it at a moment in time when we are all physically separated and unable to move and, 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 and meet? And how uh, do we engage uh, with these uh, conventions? So here we go. Thank you very much, uh, Mustafa. I think it's very interesting. I have two, two points to, to highlight. Um, the, the museum, um, after the renovation, is an amazing building just to walk the whole day and I spend, I would say, the whole day. I, I spent one day since morning when it opened up until late afternoon uh, just to visit the two buildings plus the rooftop uh, with the garden is, is an amazing. And the view is also uh, it's very interesting. The, the other point I, I would like to highlight also is that uh, I have seen uh, Latin Mohidin works uh, during the exhibition during here in, in, at the National Gallery. And I have seen a lot of uh, sketches that he did before doing the actual painting. And also this is very interesting the way he, he worked his works uh, to the final uh, stage, of which, which is the old oil painting. Um, maybe I, I, I will come back to you later on on sure. the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, let me let me call upon uh, Aaron uh, to share with us curating and collecting on a new and on the new normal. My apologies, please, Aaron. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ernesto. And um, let me just start by uh, thanking um, uh, Shalini for the in, for the invitation to be here uh, today for the Gallery Weekend Kuala Lumpur. 
So I'm going to take a slightly different approach. I think uh, one of the things that I'm talking about really is going to be around uh, some of the practices within the, within the museum itself around art education and how a museum now might engage with its publics and its constituencies. So we're nearly approaching the anniversary of the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think we can be begin to better understand how our daily lives have changed and the many, many challenges we face as we adapt to a new normal lifestyle. I think it's an incredibly inelegant um, uh, phrase, but I think it's a, a phrase that we've, we're, we're stuck with. In this short period of time, there has been an extraordinary upheaval of the regular processes and practices of museums with respect to almost everything. Erin, I think we are losing you. We can't hear you. Um, as I mentioned, Aaron currently is in Sydney, uh, and then he is three or four hours ahead of us. So, Aaron, I can't hear you. Stephanie, would, would it be possible to uh, write to him just to let him know? It has. Uh, okay. Because uh, I think they even the image also has frozen up. I think he dropped off. Uh, maybe give him a few minutes to come back in. Um, okay. Perhaps you can ask a few questions in the meantime, if you like. Yes, uh, I would like to the audience, please uh, feel free to write the, um, the, your question in the QA bo box uh, at the bottom of your screen so we can share that with the panelists. Uh, we have a three exciting, really uh, well known panelists, and, and I think this is one of the million opportunities to ask, you know, uh, from the business point of view or from the, your, own, your own practice, if you are an artist or if you are galleries or if you are a curator or a lecturer from the university, it would be nice to see your views and, and your questions so they, they can share with us. Um, I was saying, Mustafa, that after the renovation, when the building was done, uh, it's really interesting to just to walk through. And, and, I, and I have noticed that there is a lot of collections which are being loaned to the museum from private owners, from Singapore private families, which are being loaned to the to the museum for exhibitions like two, three months, uh, ongoing exhibition, you know. I, I think this is, this is uh, remarkable uh, because um, collect a number of paintings and then loan to the museum for, for the public to see it, you know. Mostly I will buy it and put it in my house, you know, for, for, my, own, for my own pleasure to, every day, you know. How, how, how does the, the, the museum approach these uh, sort of families? Or are the families coming to the museum and say, hey, I have this uh, you know, a number of paintings from these artists or from these periods because this family will buy by, by years. And, uh, you know? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, and so I mean, I think uh, this, is, this is very much uh, kind of uh, 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 an established convention uh, within, uh, Kind of uh, museological work uh, where uh, we have uh, uh, an entire group uh, of curators. I call it the curatorium, uh, mm. and uh, the curators are developing research on a number of fronts. I think, as I shared, uh, yes, and uh, they range across uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, what we do often is also maintain uh, really uh, extensive uh, links and networks uh, with key. Uh, collections. These could be public or they could be private. Mm -hmm. And uh, when uh, the need arises, we approach them for loans. Uh, some of these loans uh, can be for the short term, for changing exhibitions, obviously, which is about four to six months, uh, yes. or it could be on a long term uh, basis as part of the long term display. So we do have works on loan, uh, such as the one I showed you from the Smithsonian, uh, yes. which is uh, on a much longer term. So we've had it on loan for about over two years now. So, uh, so those are companions from museum to museum, isn't it? Yeah. And the same okay. applies to private collections as well. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay. Edward, I, I, I was looking at your exhibition and your presentation, and I, I, I think that uh, if being 
a challenge, I believe, in the first three months of the year where everyone didn't know what to do, where to start. How did you start it uh, on having this pandemic and suddenly say, hey, you cannot come to the office and, and you have to, you know, re reschedule all your, your meetings and, you know, museums and galleries and Sotheby's, I believe, prepare all the events a year ahead. So how, how, how did you tackle that? Just unmuting myself. Um, well, it was a huge challenge, um, as it was for everybody. Um, but as, as I mentioned, we had invested hugely in, in our digital platforms. We, we'd invested tens of millions of dollars um, over some years, and we were sort of ready to go with transitioning live sales into online only sales. Um, that sort of work that's done under the bonnet, so to speak, and you know, by our IT teams, I don't really understand it, um, but they managed to do that very rapidly and successfully. And uh, the specialist community rallied round. I mean, the specialists fetishize the physical catalog and the physical exhibition and the live auction. Uh, that's one of the most rewarding aspects of a specialist job is is producing the product, the catalogue, and yes. and um, curating the the exhibition, etc. So specialists are very reluctant to give up on the physical and live aspects of auctioneering. Um, but um, you know, necessity being the mother of invention, we had to do it, and we did it very fast. And it's proved, as I explained in my presentation, it, it proved remarkably successful. And we were astonished really how prepared our clients were to, to make that shift, particularly the older generation. I mentioned that 40% of our clients are, are now under 40, but 40% of our clients are over 60 and 10% of our clients are over 70. And many of those collectors, um, some of them don't even have a computer. And um, I, I, just to give you <clears throat> personal experience, I have a very traditional client who was saying, you know, I, I can't deal with this. Um, I can, I, I can, I'll never engage electronically. What is this? You know, give me a physical catalog. And I handed him an iPad. He started playing with it. And like a five-year-old child, within 10 minutes, he was hooked. And it just shows that, you know, it, it's really, it's like setting up a, when you, if you remember the first time you set up an online bank account and you thought, oh God, this is terrible. You know, I, yes. I want I want to go to the bank and I want to speak to the bank manager. And then once you do it and once you set it up on your phone with the app and everything, it's all so much easier. So it, it was a remarkably swift and easy transition, much faster and and easier than we had anticipated. Edward, also, I want I would like to ask you, how do you under this pandemic, how do you transfer? Or the physical artworks, which is being auctioned uh, or is being uh, taken care of by the by the uh, institution and then delivered on time or maybe next year. Yes, the, the sh shipping and logistics was hugely disrupted, of course, um, but the majority of these works were already in our possession, and our photographers and handlers um, continued to operate as normal. Mm -hmm behind the scenes. I mean, the photographers have been working throughout the throughout lockdown. Um, some of them actually living in the office. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I believe so many of us are working from home, but some of us are, are living at work. <laughs> yeah, I believe so, because I was locked down in March also, the, the, the first three, three months after March, uh, totally from home, everything I had to reinvent it myself and thank, thank God I have a computer and other gadgets to play around because I'm lecturing and uh, it was online and I, also the timing is very important because I have a student from everywhere and they couldn't attend, uh, you know, physically come to Malaysia because it was closed down. Uh, Mustafa, one of the things I would like to ask you is about how do you, how do you start uh, a research based project? Uh, are you meet with your, your team and you propose or uh, how, how do you tackle that? Well, I think uh, what we do have uh, at the gallery are certain, uh, what we call like kind of curatorial pillars, right? Mm -hmm. And these pillars essentially engage uh, with all sorts of uh, kind of uh, potential lines of inquiry uh, that connect with the story of Southeast Asian art. So for, for example, um, 
the Latif Mohidin project uh, that I discussed with you. Now, this emerges yeah. from a much longer inquiry into the story of global modernisms. And uh, of course, no, we know that the story of global modernism has been written largely from the perspective of the territorial West. And uh, essentially what happened uh, in, well, I would say large parts of Asia, uh, well, Japan is included and represented very well, uh, but uh, the rest of Asia kind of is uh, still, there's so much work to be done and Southeast Asia being one such zone. Of course, Asia, you could talk about Africa, Latin America and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. And uh, so uh, one of the conversations uh, that emerged uh, was between colleagues uh, at the Pompidou Center, such as Catherine David, and, uh, and, and the curators of the National Gallery um, uh, in terms of who are the figures uh, within the story of Southeast Asian art who really kind of led um, the, the, this, 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 this shift. And obviously, Latif Mohedin is one such leading figure uh, within the yes. And so yes. in a sense, I think it emerges uh, from, I would say, multiple sources. Yes. Uh, but often uh, it is very much lodged uh, within the kind of very deep uh, research interests uh, that uh, the institution uh, is developing. Uh, so the other uh, example perhaps I could uh, tell you is in terms of uh, what we call like um, front runners. Uh, so mm. uh, these are individuals who radically reworked the very conventions of uh, the aesthetic phenomenon, right, for their yes. generation. Uh, so obviously, again, the Latin Moedian project kind of connects with this, but there's a whole range of other fi figures, right, uh, that mm. we prospect. And this is also how uh, the project is connected, our research is connected to uh, the permanent galleries or the long-term displays, right, on Singapore and Southeast Asian art. So yeah. often we test bed smaller projects in oh, okay. the, the long-term displays, and then we expand them into much mm. deeper uh, exhibitions. So for example, uh, when I spoke about the Radhan Saleh and the One Lunar exhibition, One Lunar being kind of a critical uh, leading figure in 19th century, late 19th century uh, Filipino art circles, he was also mm. connected to the, the freedom movement uh, led by Jose Rizal and so on and so forth in Madrid. Uh, those two artists were es essentially uh, presented first within the Southeast Asia galleries when we launched. And their juxtaposition uh, suggested that there were these incredible affinities uh, that both of them shared uh, mm. in relation to the 19th century and in thinking about a kind of uh, uh, Indonesia that is yet to be and the Philippines that is yet to be, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, the, and, and this incredible uh, exhibition resulted from uh, uh, the research done by my colleagues, uh, specifically Russell Stora and uh, Clarissa Chikyamko. So I think this is um, this is sort of the methods uh, that that we use. The, of course, the the, the other method is uh, that emerges uh, through discursive programs. Mm -hmm. So often yeah. uh, we're having a panel discussion, and yes. an idea emerges, um, uh, and and it's something that's worth looking into. So it's it's highly curatorially driven. So uh, you have like a brainstorming session, session and then uh, everyone will draw different projects and see yeah, what are the dynamics. Yeah, we have those as well. So essentially, uh, you have the curatorium that is constantly dynamic. It's very yes. dynamic. You know, I mean, we speak, I think, like almost 30 languages across the curatorial <laughs> team. And wow. uh, we cover yes. like 300 years of history. And I would say largely international history, because even though we talk about Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia is it, it's not isolated. It's connected to the yes. world. And uh, so in a sense, I think it, it emerges uh, from the density of of, of of thinkers uh, that make up uh, the curatorial team. I think uh, I think uh, Aaron is coming in because of uh, his connection. What? But anyway, Edward, I have a question for you. Uh, and the question is, will Sotheby continue running online auctions uh, after the, the pandemic? Yes, is the answer. Um, we will. Um, Look, um, live sales have worked very effectively for centuries and we have no plans to abandon live sales, but we're likely to see a much higher proportion of online sales going forward in light of recent successes. Um, in 2020, um, year to date, over 80% of our sales have been online only. 
and wow. uh, that's compared with less than 20% last year. So the percentage has been turned on its head. We've gone from 20% online only to 80% online only. And I think, you know, we will retain certain sales will retain the live format. I mean, certainly the, the important sort of prestigious evening sales will continue to be live yes. sales with a physical catalog, um, single owner sales and you know, collections, um, particularly where the, uh, the consigner is looking for the a sort of uh, um, a testimonial in the form of a physical catalog. And, you know, often the terms are dictated to us by the consigner, particularly when it's an, an estate or a, uh, a single owner. Um, but the future is digital. And I think these, change, these are changes that would have taken place anyway, but they've been accelerated by COVID. And one, one last thing I would say that, you know, the, the, that um, physical experiences still count and yeah. there is a, a premium attached to them. Um, but those physical experiences need to be more special than before. And, 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 and Edward, um, how do you how do you connect with uh, external consultants uh, or uh, internal advisors uh, how, how, through this pandemic? Uh, suddenly, everyone has to you know be in the same pace, kind of. Uh, how the Sotheby has leaned to to external consultants and uh, and. Um, internal advisors like yourself, you know? Well, I think it helps that our owner, Patrick Jahi, owns a media company. Uh, so we've been able to sort of, to um, benefit from his in-house experience and expertise. And um, we've teamed up with Museum TV for the uh, mm -hmm. marquee live stream sales. Um, Museum TV is a channel devoted entirely to the arts uh, which is syndicated to TV channels around the world. And that's what allowed this huge audience to tune in to the sales. That's 160,000 people wow. in the summer, summer sale tuned in, you know, compared with a maximum of about 400 that we could seat in a gallery. So it's really democratized the whole process. I mean, those 160,000 are not all bidding, of course, most of them mm. are spectators. And in fact, yes. it's, a, it's a small percentage. I think we had had 162 bidders, um, active bidders in the sales, but uh, a, a huge audience. And that's been made possible by the consultants that you asked about. Um, we also have um, a new in-house guru called Stefan Pepe, who is really the sort of the master of digital and uh, he's a new hire for Sotheby's and he has transformed our business. Uh, mm, Mustafa, I would like to ask a question. Uh, how, how the Singapore Museum or the National Museum um, procure or buy um, art to, to be part of a permanent collection? Um, do you go to auctions or um, do you sit with the artists? What, what, what is the procedure? Basically. Yeah, there are, uh, we are we are governed uh, by an acquisitions committee. Um, so essentially, uh, this is a committee that is composed of um, scholars, um, uh, individuals uh, who are kind of very much, in a sense, uh, invested uh, in questions around uh, Asian art uh, broadly. And uh, but beyond the kind of governance uh, structures uh, that we have in place. Um, of course, uh, a large part of our acquisitions funds uh, come from uh, the state. And uh, so in a sense, uh, we are still very much uh, uh, beholden uh, to uh, public uh, interests. Uh, so the, the, the methods that we use to acquire are multiple. I mean, they could uh, range uh, from acquiring from artist estates, uh, living artists, mm. uh, but also uh, from um, kind of uh, the, the gallery networks uh, that exist across uh, the world. And uh, of course, uh, in some cases uh, through auctions uh, as, as well, yeah. So it's in, multiple, yeah. Okay, so you have a, you, you have a group of people um, which really look into uh, just buying in, and that yes. is supported by curators, supported yes. by historians, uh, so I believe. Yeah, so uh, essentially a lot of the, the, the research and the proposal making is done by 
uh, the curatorial team, uh, but at yeah. the same time, we do have a dedicated uh, collections development team, mm. which is also headed by a senior curator. Um, so in a sense, uh, they're all very closely aligned uh, and kind of fall under the curatorial rubric. <laughs> under yeah. the group of people that uh, you always meet up. Yeah. I, I have a question uh, from the audience. Um, what is the, what is the, ah, Aaron is here. Hi, Aaron. How are you? Hello. <laughs> I'm, I'm I think so sorry. <laughs> you almost had <have> heart attack. <laughs> um, let me apologize. I, no I worries. Internet Good. issues. Yes. Yeah. Please, and, would you like to take us through? Yeah, and I think I think this might actually um, illustrate my point a little bit later. So, <laughs> excellent. Please, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, I'm going to start again, if that's okay, if that's okay, Ernesto. Yes, I'm fine. I'm fine. We we still have a time, and we still have a time for twenty minutes on your presentation, and then we still have an hour, another half an hour for uh, a few questions from the audience. Okay, great. Well, um, as I was saying, I think I'm, I'm taking a slightly different approach because I wanna talk about uh, some of the functions of our museum, which is really revolves around art education and what the, what the new normal uh, situation actually might mean in the context of um, delivering these types of, uh, this, this type of program into the future. So we're approaching the, the first anniversary of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think that we can understand how it has impacted our daily, daily lives. Um, it's been an extraordinary upheaval uh, of the regular practices and processes of museums and institutions um, from everything from the, the development and delivery of exhibitions through to um, art education activities and even how we identify and engage with our audiences. So the landscape where physical engagement has been subsumed by ideas and experimentation with uh, the digital. And so I think that the full impact on museums and institutions is yet to be completely, completely understood. How institutions will experiment and adapt will be, is modulated by a range of socio and economic factors, such as how widespread and available technology is and the literacy and the proficiency of its community to harness technology as these things become more available. Um, it, within our institution, our discussion has really revealed that there is a digital divide. And I think that this may also be a result of the um, uh, particular social issues which, face, um, which faces Indonesia itself as a developing, as a developing country. Um, but it, it illustrates that there is a socioeconomic context which frames how audiences will encounter culture now and in the future. And as um, curators and as people who work in the arts, we must have a greater understanding of the socio socioeconomic inequities and biases which regulate participation, not just for, the pragma for pragmatic reasons in terms of how we plan to, uh, uh, to develop and deliver programs, but also it gives us an opportunity to think about um, what we what our institutions actually do what they actually mean in society um, and what role one thinks that culture and art education has in the future so this, this is a, a very short presentation that uh, looks at some of the the internal conversations that we've been having within the museum and later on i'm going to present um, the first um, kind of hybrid program that we have developed, which is about to launch in the next in the next couple of weeks. Um, but to give a little bit of context first, Museum Matan is a very new organization. We're a private museum. We, we were established in November 2017. Uh, we, we, were the, we are the first um, modern and contemporary art museum um, in Indonesia and with a focus on art education and art appreciation. So for, for um, I think it's also important to have a little bit of context in terms of how big the city is. The city is 10, 10, and, a half million, uh, 10 and a half million people. Um, prior to the pandemic, th these, these figures would fluctuate day to night and it would be interesting to see whether or not these things have uh, still continue to fluctuate. And currently these are quite current figures, I believe is 102,000 COVID infections. Um, 
this is a this is I I want to I want to thank my education team who pulled together some uh, some data around um, access to education. And even though we're talking about the education sector in this data set, I think it, there are things that we can learn uh, it, for for museums and institutions in terms of uh, how we assume that people engage with us. So um, in Indonesia, there's about 80 to 100 million internet users. And you can see the demographic spread, uh, the, the demographic spread there. Um, when it comes to students learning online, online, and this is within the pandemic period, um, 60 million students face, face difficulties in the online learning. Uh, less than 15% of students in villages and rural, rural areas have access to computers and the internet, and only 25% in, in cities and urban areas have access to computers and internet. And internet. Um, the, in terms of the school internet access, I, I, the, this last point, which says that 13,000 school students and teachers don't have access uh, at all, I think is, is uh, uh, instructive. And then I think um, the, the last, the last um, column, which talks about the experience of students in the learning environments during, during lockdown, um, only 68 68 percent have, have internet access that there's lots of social so, so, social social issues that arise from the lack of the lack of interaction so i think what these uh, statistics highlight is that there are real challenges facing educators in the context of online learning environments and we can extrapolate that there are structural problems with access and the socioeconomic factors which drive the capacity of a student to engage and to, and to learn um, so I think that, you know, as, as I was saying, as I was alluding to before, that these are really important things for institutions to think about, that we can't just assume that by creating and delivering something online that we're, we're going to be able to achieve that greater mission that we have in terms of um, uh, uh, broad social, social engagement. So for us, we, we decided to close the museum quite early in the pandemic. Um, on the 14th of March, we closed our doors. And this was 11 days into two major and complex ex exhibitions, which we had just opened. One was a uh, major survey of performance art by the Indonesian artist Melati Siradamo. It, was her, it, it is her first museum uh, survey. And, uh, complex undertaking, considering all of the moving parts that were that were required for this particular project, and the other was a large video installation of the German artist Julian Rosenfeld. So this is a the installation view of uh, Julian's project. Um, it, 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 in, I, I think that this is probably the the largest video installation that's ever been presented in in uh, Indonesia, it's very, it's highly complicated. Um, uh, lots of lots of technology that was re required to present it. And Melati Shiradamo, her performance um, exhibition is made up of, of, of uh, many different uh, live performances that were going to unfold over the period of the exhibition. So like many museums around the world, we very quickly began discussions about how we should respond to the pandemic. Uh, we established an internal team to review um, and to plan. And we were guided by, I, I suppose, a number of uh, principles in, in making our decisions about what we would do. And one was, um, it wasn't just about programming that, we were, that, that was a challenge for us. It was a complete shift in thinking about um, how to operate the, operate the museum. So we had to think about um, our, our human resources. How, how, how do staff uh, work from home? We had to think about uh, really, really technical things around the facility facility itself. So we took the, the approach that we wanted to firstly slow down. We, instead of pumping out things, we actually slowed down to actually review what we had already produced over the last couple of years and where we needed to um, digitize and where we, and, and to index. Um, we also uh, chose to, um, we understood who our core audience was for this, and it was mostly 
teachers and also um, parents at home who were, who were working with their, their children or other children um, at, at home. So this required a design response, not just a programming response. It meant that we had to, um, uh, understanding the limitations of, of internet and you know the, the broader internet capacity issues that, that people face in Indonesia, it wasn't appropriate for, for us to produce um, uh, heavy, highly technical video, videos. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the information that we were producing was easily accessible um, uh, by the people who, who needed it. So in, in many cases, it required us to redesign uh, remove color, remove design complexity from uh, downloadable um, materials. So this is a, these are a number of things that we, we, we um, in our museum from home um, page, there's, there's uh, different types of activities that have, that is primarily, be, primarily been led by the education and public programs team. And I think that that has been one of the big shifts within this period is that um, normally when you think about a museum, you think about exhibitions. But uh, in the last nine months, when, when we have been going out there, it's actually been um, uh, the education and the public programs team have taken up a lot of the, the thinking and the um, help to help the, the curators and the, and the, rest, of the uh, rest of the departments to, uh, to push an agenda of broader um, uh, art education and engagement. Um, so we have a number of key principles. One was around accessibility, reviewing existing programs, and only gradually introducing uh, new programs when we when we felt that we were in a better position um, to to do so. And then the the third one really is around social media. And social media, I mean, it, it really depends in which kind of um, territorial context that you're that you're talking in. I, I think for for people living in in Southeast Asia and Asia generally, social media is is um, um, very much part and parcel to the institutional perspective, and it's something that we took up in 2017 when we um, uh, when we developed. The, the museum, that we have a very young audience in Indonesia, uh, mostly a new art going audience. Many people had never been inside a museum before. So we really embraced social media as being as a platform to uh, drive conversations around art education. In the pandemic period, it became even more um, uh, important to us because it, th these are existing platforms which have already um, worked through those issues around uh, how much data it chews up and, and who, who, who it speaks to. And so actually, um, when we look at our highlights over the last couple of, couple of months, we've been able to reach people over a much broader geography than what we would normally do if we were only um, physically uh, open to the public. And I think um, in many ways it has um, brought forward lots of the conversations around what our digital policies look like in, into the future. Um, you know, yeah, un un unfortunately we've had to really um, push these ideas uh, earlier uh, rather than having that, that luxury of being able to plan, plan them out. So our um, Museum from Home page has had over 100,000 100, web page views and, and there have been over two and a half million impressions um, on, on Instagram. We run a podcast in the middle column there. We run a, a regular podcast called Machan A to Z, which is a, um, it's about an hour discussion of uh, bite-sized discussions of um, art-related uh, art -related topics. And in that period, I mean, it's also hosted on Spotify that we've had six and a half thousand podcast down, down, downloads. I mean, if you could imagine that you, you would never be able to fill a um, uh, auditorium up uh, in order to, to, to reach these types of types of audiences. And then the other thing that we, we did was we, um, uh, going back to the, to the social media um, idea is that we, we ran a number of audio guides, which were which were written and led by the curatorial team around uh, works that were in the collection, and instead of delivering this as a video, we delivered it as a sound recording on on um, Instagram, and you can see see that it you know for one of the most controversial and one of the the, the most important works of this period in in the collection, 
uh, that we've had over 30, 37,000 uh, people engage with this one, partic one particular, particular work. Uh, these are figures that we, as I was saying before, that uh, we could never really, um, we could only hope for in, 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 in terms of the, the physical engagements with people. So it's taken us a little while but this December, we are actually launching our first um, new project. And it is a, what we've kind of described as a hybrid uh, project. Um, it is a uh, children's art space commission by the Balinese painter Chitra Sesnita. And it, it began its life as an idea for a physical exhibition. We run a, a program with children's art space commissions where artists, make installations for children. They work with that education team to develop activities. And there's lots of hands-on engagement. There's lots of, um, it, it, is a, it is a physical environment. And we knew that, as, that this, co the, the, the commission could not operate in the same way that, it, that the others had. And so we took, uh, we, we, we paused and we engaged with, um, uh, went through a process of engaging with all of the, the key partners on this particular project, in particular, the artists. And Chitra was, was, was really great in, in helping us to, to adapt our expectations of the commission to, um, um, to, to also to her experience of, of online environments. So this is a hybrid work in the sense that it contains a whole range of physical, so there will be an exhibition, it's, it has just been installed, as well as web AR, so augmented reality components, um, as, and also um, introducing, introducing parts of this, parts of this uh, work into public space in and around uh, Jakarta. So Chitra has, um, what you might be able to see in this painting, it, it looks like a uh, traditional, um, uh, painting using uh, using the, the, the narrative of, of Bal Balinese painting and creating highly complicated um, uh, stories. There's stories within stories within stories, and this is the idea that that Chitra really really helped us to develop and utilize the um, uh, social media engagement as a way of getting uh, students and children to also assist with the creation of stories within those stories within those stories um, and that I think is a real driving part of this project called Tales of Nowhere. So there are QR codes that will um, uh, are interactive uh, across the city and uh, she's creating a storybook uh, project as well so that there that this, the, the storybook will come alive through web AR. You will also hear the artist uh, speak and to describe it. And, uh, the, and participants will also be able to, to um, uh, create and add to, the, add to the development of that story itself. So I think what we, what we really have kind of um, uh, experience is two things, is really a, the need for a pragmatic approach. How do we change? How do, how, do we, how do we deliver in this environment? But I think it also requires us to be more also idealistic. You know, we're, we're a young institution and, and, and it's, not, it's not so far off from our, uh, you know, the founding ideals of, of, of the museum around um, access. So we have to use this opportunity as a way to elevate access and broad social engagement. And I think that the challenge for us, I mean, that's the reason why, why those statistics were, were used at the beginning of the presentation was just to illustrate how, how much challenge there is uh, within the kind of new normal uh, situation for Indonesia. And thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Very interesting the way a very young institution has approached the issue of the COVID-19. Um, okay, I have a question from the audience, and I and I think uh, they are really related to the to the topic of if the museum move online, the majority of exhibition at the moment are moving online. Do you think that it will be difficult for the museum to revert back to the physical exhibitions? after the, the COVID-19 uh, event, maybe next year. 
anyone, please feel free. Uh, Mustafa, would you think that is, is going back to, you know, to our previous time where everyone free and easy, you know, going around. Uh, I have seen a lot of three-dimensional exhibition in walkthrough uh, from a European museum, which is very common. Um, do you think that, you know, would you go going back to, to the physical exhibitions? Yeah, maybe I can uh, answer this uh, with two points. Uh, the first is that, um, of course, I'm speaking um, about the National Gallery here. I mean, it is a museum of uh, historical materials, right? And uh, in a sense, I think uh, materials that were, were built to be experienced in a given space, I think uh, cannot uh, simply be transformed uh, into the digital realm. So I think we have to be a bit cautious about this. Um, and uh, the, the second point perhaps I want to make is that uh, at the same time, this presents an incredible opportunity. And I think um, this emerges uh, from one key realization, I think, uh, that large uh, museums around the world, I think, have had, and I think including the National Gallery, is that in a sense, over the last, I would say, 30 to 40 years, uh, large museum institutions have become uh, heavily intertwined with kind of large neoliberal projects, right? And in a sense, they are heavily intertwined and reliant on publics uh, that come to its buildings, right? So you could take tourists, for example, right? And then when the pandemic hit, obviously the tourists dried up. And in a sense, uh, this opened up uh, this incredible space uh, to rethink how museums actually could potentially relate to the city. Um, and I think, uh, I, I don't really know uh, what these new formats of working will be, right? I mean, I, I, I don't want to speak about the future uh, with certainty. What but about the near, the, near, the near future, maybe yeah, next year? But, yeah, but I know one thing, and, and that is that, in a sense, uh, to engage with the digital, we will have to engage with artists and engage with artists in the sense that then the digital itself becomes the medium that is being discussed, debated, unpacked. And I think this is what I was sort of trying to get at uh, with the example uh, by the artist, the Singaporean artist, Bani Haikos, that yes, uh, this is a kind of an abstracted space of, of a kind of a physical location uh, in Singapore, but what are you actually experiencing here? You know, uh, I think I think these are these are very fundamental questions uh, that museums will ask uh, because yes, I I, I I agree to some extent the the very uh, nature that museums had with its publics has shifted. That much I think we agree. Um, it's just what is this new uh, kind of aesthetic uh, uh, that awaits us is is yet to be seen. So I don't think, I mean, the simple answer would be, I don't think the digital is going to replace uh, the physical. I think that would be rather naive uh, in a sense. Um, I, think, I think it's just that the digital has, presents all these newer possibilities, but also newer issues, right? Because obviously there's a whole series of ethical questions that we need to ask uh, that are connected with uh, the digital as they're emerging privacy issues and so on and so forth. So I think I think it's it's going to be an interesting next few years, if not the immediate I, future. Yeah, I, I believe so. Uh, what about Aaron? What do you think? Will your physical exhibition will bring people back? You think? Uh, I hope so. I think I think that um, um, I, I think that people really, really miss um, the the physical experience of art, and I I, I agree with Ms. Nafta that that the the, the reproduction is not always the, the the best way to experience or to, to, to engage with it there are things that you can uh, learn from it there are resonances that come out from it when you when you when, <clears throat> when you do experience it in, 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 in that way but but um, the, the the ultimate answer is going to be in the hands of the artists and uh, the institutions will have to um, uh, respond or to follow the artists at, 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 at some point in terms of what they're what they're producing and what them what they're making. I mean, but let's also say that uh, even pre pre COVID, not all exhibitions lived in galleries and museums anyway. So I think that think that this is this is a um, 
um, th there is no, no real, no really, no certainty in, in, in how you can approach the future. But I think that um, the silver lining is that perhaps there is more uh, possibilities and more thinking that will come out of it. Vanessa, can I address this question? Yes, please. Uh, go ahead. I, I know that I represent an auction house, but I, I'm a bit of an imposter um, <laughs> answering a question about museums. But <clears throat> um, I think we're, we're dealing with the same concern, which is the importance of the physical encounter with the artwork and the importance mm -hmm. of human connections. And you know, really, it's the difference between online dating and live dating. You know, it's only in the flesh that the sparks you mentioned, fly. Yes. Um, so, uh, whilst these changes um, are transformative, of course, um, as human beings, we will always crave, we will always crave uh, the, the physical experience. But it strikes me that museums are more dependent than auction houses on real life visitors. And um, I would ask the um, museum professionals here, you know, how, and it's a it's a course question in, in one sense. How how do museums monetize the virtual experience? And when you create virtual gallery experiences, the experiences that replicate the feeling of walking through a physical space, um, do you charge for these? I mean, I notice that the National Gallery in London is currently charging eight pounds for the virtual tour of the mm. Artemisia Gentileschi yes. ex exhibition. So I think the challenge there for museums is how to monetize the digital alternatives um, to stay relevant, stay vital, provide employment and education and serve the community. The question is for you guys. Um, maybe I can speak, uh, Aaron, you want. Um, yeah, I think uh, Edward, I, I, I wouldn't use the word monetize in this sense because we are a public institution, but I would certainly uh, address that question uh, with the phrase uh, sustainable. So sustainable uh, both financially, but also in terms of the institution's ecological impact. But I also think that in a sense, it's important uh, to try and explore how uh, this question around uh, audiences, right? And this question of numbers uh, that many large institutions have been kind of pitching uh, as a kind of a clear stay of their livelihoods, I think needs to be rethought. And it needs to be rethought in terms of social impact. So how does the museum generate programs that are, if I may say even, in tension with the market and also in terms of thinking about critical issues that people are facing and then enabling a lot of these questions through artistic practice and then measuring that social impact. So I think there will be this shift that will come, uh, which will move from the kind of numbers game, uh, I suppose, uh, to measuring social impact. And how do we measure the social impact? It's up for debate. Um, how do we do it in different contexts? So for example, how we would do it in Singapore, for example, would be very different from how Aaron would do it in Indonesia. Uh, because obviously the, 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 the social uh, conventions and uh, infrastructures are completely different uh, in that sense. So yeah, this is sort of uh, how I would think it's going to change. I have a question for three of you. It's one of, uh, from one of the audience. I, I believe you know, she's very young and um, She's planning to go into um, curatorial uh, kind of work. Um, what would be your advice for someone who is young and study perhaps history uh, or art history or social science uh, subjects, and then eventually would like to be associated with an institution of, you know, like Sotheby or, um, or practice their, their own practice? What would, you be, what would be your advice on, on this young uh, student who is hoping, you know, one day be sitting on your place and, you know, sharing uh, their expertise. And, you know, uh, I think the younger generation in, in Southeast Asia, I, I believe it's very rare to find people who parents will allow the students to go into social science and become a, a curator, you know. <laughs> in Western country, they are a bit more open-minded, I believe, you know. So what would be your advice for, for this young fellow where um, she's planning to, to go into this sort of a line of business? Um, anyone, uh, Aaron, perhaps? Uh, um, well, I think that I think that we're about to see massive uh, 
shifts if we haven't already seen them. I mean, I think that that uh, all three of us have 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 illustrated, uh, so, you know, the, the the how our lives and our uh, lively, livelihoods have been disrupted. So I think, in many ways, for a young person, this is a this is a great opportunity. I mean, it's a it, it's it's a um, we're about to enter into an age which is almost. Um, um, you know, for, for, for the for the digital native, it becomes it becomes much more easy to navigate rather than uh, compared to a middle aged man. So I think that there 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 you know I think that it, it is it is um, important to see the silver lining that that the role of the role of the if the role of the institution really is, is, one of the roles is is about um, being effectively communicating. So I think that. Um, if sure that there's there is short term disruption, but it's not. I, I hope uh, that this is not the end of end end of our livelihoods. Mustafa, would you like to add on from your from your expertise? Yeah, uh, everything you guys are very that young. said, uh, <laughs> but uh, maybe one more uh, point is um, to keep engaging uh, with creative practice, I think, uh, because uh, the, for me, at least, the curatorial exists uh, in relation uh, to artistic work, right? And in a way, it is also a, a means through which one can facilitate that process. And uh, I think the best place uh, to start thinking about being a curator amidst all these shifts, right, is to connect with artists and uh, begin to think about what exactly uh, artistic practice is doing at this moment in time. Um, not the future and maybe not even the past, I think uh, just at this moment, because I think the present is, is opaque uh, at this moment. <laughs> the future is uncertain, uncertain and the past yes. is complex uh, to yes. say the least. So I think to engage with this opaqueness, yeah. To be unafraid, yeah. Edward. I think. Well, I, I would your... agree with both. I would agree with both my fellow panelists. Um, uh, firstly, um, as as Aaron said, this is a moment of evolutionary change, uh, which is throwing up huge opportunities for young people. And I think once the pandemic has passed, and um, those, it will be easier to realize and appreciate those opportunities. Uh, and secondly, as Mustafa said. Um, um, through, as um, as a, a, somebody who has ambitions to enter the sort of art world, the art e ecosystem, um, immerse yourself in practices. Immerse yourself in ev everything. I mean, if if you're if you have plans to go into the commercial arena, then I would say you know attend as many exhibitions as possible, um, attend live auctions. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about attending them virtually. Um, there are, um, ed educate yourself in the marketplace, look at Artnet, look at pricing, and also um, you can enroll for online courses. Um, if you go on the Sotheby's website, one of our brand extensions is Sotheby's Institute, which is a sort of mini university where you can get a BA and MA, you can even do a PhD, which is all the courses are validated by the University of Manchester. And um, that was my inroad into the business. I started at Sotheby's Institute. I was a student. Um, I got my MA from there and validated by Manchester University. I then started as a student lecturer um, supporting the professor. I then got a full-time job teaching um, and I then went into education and for seven years I was at the University of London and then later I, was, I went back to the auction house. Um, but I think the advantage of those uh, types of encounters is you you build up a network and you meet people within the field and opportunity opportunities develop from those encounters okay uh, i think we are about to wrap up and just very short uh question for each one of you um edward on your in your case when Sotheby um, do this online auction, are you afraid, is the company afraid of any sort of a fraud, uh, you know, from buyers where sometimes uh, might disappear on uh, within the buying uh, time? Uh, any, any, any? Uh, well, well you, you need to have an account with Sotheby's in order to register to bid. 
so all the checks are done in advance. Mm -hmm. um, I think our probably our biggest fear is that tech, the technology will fail during the auction. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but you can I see as, so. we, as we as we witnessed in this in this we just witnessed with Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly you're going um, to buy, you know, buy. <laughs> Um, oh my God! You, you could. You, I mean, we we did have. Uh, I mean, an auction that I was directly directly involved with in November. We had a disruption when our internet went down in the middle, and we had to pause the auction for ten minutes. So I think uh, that's my biggest fear because um, the auction is so dependent on you know keep on the pace, the moment on momentum, and keeping the excitement um, and. Um, when the internet goes down, that can be hugely disruptive. I, I think glitches are a fact of life, but you know we've done everything we can to mitigate against them, and we're as well prepared for every eventuality as, as we can be. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mustafa and Aaron, I have a question. Uh, what are your expectations for next year? Sorry, could you repeat that? What are your expectations from, from your uh, line of work uh, on next year? And you just mentioned uncertainty. <laughs> so the near future. Get, get, through, get through this year first. That's my expectation for next year. Uh, no, but um, uh, really, I think, uh, I think it's to uh, keep working. And uh, keep working, uh, obviously, um, with a, a very kind of a critical eye on, on what's happening and what's shifting around us and uh, constantly thinking about how we can expand uh, the public uh, for uh, the museum uh, quite literally. I think. And I think this is, again, going back to that question about the digital, uh, this is what it has offered us, right? Um, so on the one hand, we're expanding our publics in ways that uh, we don't fully understand yet also. Um, so each time we have, uh, say, an online uh, panel discussion, we have three, 400 people attending it. You know, this is not wow. even possible uh, in the large theater uh, that the, uh, or the auditorium that the National mm -hmm. Gallery has. And these are individuals coming in from all parts of the world, you know? So I think this is quite amazing and incredible. But I think uh, curatorially uh, also, I think during the pandemic, um, um, maybe not just myself, but colleagues have found themselves also speaking uh, to other colleagues mm -hmm. uh, beyond uh, kind of the geographical remit uh, that they, they occupy, you know. So I found myself speaking uh, to colleagues uh, in Latin America or to, in, in Africa or in the Middle East and so on and so forth, or even in South Asia. So I think, I think this, is, this is, I'm looking forward to this. And I, I think in a sense, whilst we are all staying at home, We've also kind of found ways to connect, and 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 I think that's difficult. I know at this moment in time because there are large parts of the world which are fighting for survival. I think, <laughs> right? Quite literally. Yes. Um, and yes. so I think I think um, beyond uh, the biological need to stay alive, um, I think I think we should not forget that connecting is. Uh, is, is, is critical and, and that solidarity uh, is, is critical. And this will take us into the future. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Aaron, just um, your, your final input and then I would like to invite uh, Zalini. You know, to talk to uh, us it, it's, it's very similar to Mustafa, I think that I think, um, but we're, we're also planning to reopen. I think that that is something which we are all, all, all of the staff are looking forward to. Uh, the pandemic is, has sh shifted how we think, uh, how the curators do research. Um, so maybe we will see this manifest in the programs uh, over the next couple of years. I mean, definitely next year. Um, the 2021 program is on a much smaller scale um, there's much more uh, local research that's been done, research which, which is easier, easier to manage. And this is something which is really enjoyable, actually, to, to um, you know, to, to spend time um, looking at your immediate context, the, the, the context which you often overlook to do the, to do the work that you, that you normally have to do in, in, in your, uh, in, in your annual program. So, so it's, it's, it, in many ways, it's, um, in terms of the, the, the research, it's, it's been an opportunity to regroup. 
Thank you very much, Erin. Shalini, would you like to uh, come in? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I want a, a big thank you to Edward, to Erin, uh, to Mustafa and Ernesto for a really enlightening and encouraging and very positive rendition and uh, experiential introduction into what each of you have been involved in. And, and of course, I think this session is a testament also to your resilience to pivot. Um, as we saw so ably done by all of you and the fact that the audience really wanted to continue the conversation. So I thank you very much for that input and that professional um, expertise and sharing. I'd also like to thank uh, Stephanie of the Penang Art District for her technical expertise, the GWKL team for their excellent coordination. And um, GWKL has also had to pivot this year into the virtual realm. And what that's led to is really greater outreach virtually. And you'll see from our audience there that they are incredibly international. So we have embraced this platform as also being an extension uh, of accessibility, which is what we seek to do. And I think that to your point of the virtual realm continuing, that is definitely also very much part of our plan. But the physical embrace um, and presence, I think we'll find when we come out of this lockdown and the movement control, we hope everyone will run to physical spaces, you know, and want to experience them again. I think it's certainly made me much more appreciative of visiting museums and, and not taking those experiences of being in an auction room or being at a lecture physically, not taking it for granted. And just referring as a final line to something Mustafa mentioned, I think it was what Latif had referred to in poetry, that new ways of thinking come out of world challenges. And really it is about survival of the fittest and adapting and evolving. And based on what all of you have said today, we have every great faith that you will involve, evolve and pivot and give us much more than probably you ever anticipated. In the, in the years to come, in your institution and personally. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you for our audience. Thank you, Salini. Um, just, just to wrap up, uh, I would like to thank you, Edward, Mustafa and Aaron for, for being here with us and to the audience uh, and for the question that has been said. And also to Stephanie uh, being uh, our technical support in, in, uh, in, during this talk. Um, I wish you well. I wish that this is not the, the, is the first, but not the last. And I hope to see you around and I hope to visit Singapore and walk around to the museum again. Edward, it's a pleasure to meet you uh, throughout this discussion in, in a, few, a few days be, uh, back. Aaron, also interesting, interesting dialogue that you have with your students uh, because institutions are made for the students also, uh, you know, when they come and see uh, the physical aspect of an exhibition, the work, how the artists work, it's, it's, a, it's a communication, as you mentioned. Mustafa, thank you very much again. It's nice meeting you. And to the audience, uh, to everyone, I have friends from Peru on the other side of the world. It's four o'clock in the morning. Uh, right now it's five o'clock in the morning. Today is Sunday. I have friends uh, locally in, in Southeast Asia. And um, a few of my students also joined me today. So thank you very much, everyone. Take care. and. I see you again. Bye-bye. Thank you, Edward. Bye, Aaron. Bye, Mustafa. Bye-bye.